Welcome to the Creativity Lab, the podcast that shows how to channel your creativity to live your best, most beautiful life. And now here's your host, director of the Creativity Lab at West Los Angeles College, Harvard PhD, TV writer and professor, Dr. Katherine Boutry. Welcome and thank you for joining us. Each episode, we discuss a creative approach to life's challenges. Today, we talk to acclaimed visual artist Lisa Diane Wedgworth about being an outsider artist, overcoming perfectionism, developing creative self-confidence, and defining success for yourself. Lisa is an LA-based artist whose work has been exhibited in Los Angeles, Scotland, and Paris. She teaches at LA City College. She produced Conversations About Abstraction, a discussion with six contemporary black women abstract artists, and she's the executive director of Arts at Blue Roof, an artist-run nonprofit in South LA, offering an artist residency to three underrepresented women artists per year. Lisa, thank you so much for being with us today. I'm a huge admirer of your work. Can you walk me through your journey as an artist? It began in my home. My mother was a creative, uh, an artist. Um, She studied fashion design at Cal State LA. And our home was filled with all sorts of artifacts. And my mother really encouraged us to make art and explore the arts. We took art classes at Barnsdall Art Park and we went to LACMA, you know, to see shows. I don't have any memory of going to galleries, but we definitely went to museums. So being in art um, environments um, around creative people, all of my mother's friends were creative in some aspect. So it was just always around me. Um, I didn't use the term artist, but I was making art. I, I always gravitated to you know, the art classes and and book making and things of that nature when I was little and it just continued and it was just a natural part of my academic pursuit. In high school I took photography classes. When I went to Howard University I took photography classes, interior design, and I was always surrounded by creative people. So it was just a part of my natural journey, you know, that I can't imagine my life not having art included in some way. It sounds like you explored different genres. How did you land on painting? You know, when I went to Howard University, I studied photography and left Howard and um, was living this, you know, bohemian life in my 20s, hanging around with poet friends, reading poetry at the world stage, and I was taking their photographs. And when I, and I was painting at home. Um, I was never trained as a painter when I was painting at home. And I, you know, I'd get cardboard boxes and cut them up, or if you know something was delivered and the cardboard box was huge, I'd paint on that. I didn't buy canvases. I, I was making, but I really didn't know about being an artist mm. and all of that. And um, it wasn't until I got, I pursued my master's degree, where I had the option of, at Cal State LA, where I had the option of choosing photography or studio art. And I chose studio art because I knew I wanted to learn more about painting and I wanted to have my own studio. If I chose photography, I'd have a dark room, but Mm. I wouldn't have space to explore with sculpture and painting and all of that. So I chose studio and that's where I started painting. Did you have any obstacles, either interior or exterior, to I, pursuing art as a career? Well, not as not pursuing art, but along the journey. Like there were, you know, comparing myself to other people, mm. having doubts. Um, even when I was in grad school, I took a quarter off. We were in the quarter system because I wanted to really understand what was inspiring me and motivating me in the work that I was making. But also when I was painting, my style was very different. This was before I started working in abstraction. And there are people who painted in very photorealistic ways, and I wasn't painting that way, so I thought I wasn't a good painter. Or I Mm -hmm. had certain ideas that when I shared them, they were always knocked down, and I thought, oh wow, this, my ideas aren't good enough. Um, But I didn't, if I had understood, had the, if I had had the wisdom then, um, or had someone around me saying, oh no, these are great, explore, you know, try these, investigate, then it would have been a different experience. I didn't start doing that really until afterwards uh, with some of the, the, the new materials that I wanted to explore with. But it was really that. Um, and I think, you know, being a single parent, you know, mm-hmm. and I want to be clear, not my child was never an obstacle, <laughs> but it was, you know, working multiple jobs while I'm in grad school, while I'm pursuing this, you know, 
being a parent, all of those things, you know, that pull you in different directions. Sure. Um, but I just, you know, you just have to persevere and just keep going and figure out how to balance it and, and do things in a manner that works right for your life in that moment. What you just said really struck a chord in me. What is the balance? How do we find the balance, in your opinion? I have no idea. Well, I don't know if I ever <laughs> did. Something gets neglected, trust me. I am with you 100% in all of the challenges. What is the balance also, though, between not only balancing creative life and home life, but also in balancing constructive criticism mm -hmm. or not so constru constructive criticism and a healthy sense of, I'm doing my thing, I'm on my right track, this feels right to me. I don't know if balance is the right word, but I know that you get to a point where you no longer care what other people think, mm. and you have to prioritize yourself. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't have a mentor or consult with folks, right? Because we're all on a journey. You know, it's like, you know, someone is, wants to be an architect, but they don't study and, you know, they, I don't know anything about the language of architecture, but they take a brick and a plywood and some plaster and make a house. Well, that might work, but it might not withstand the elements and you might kill folks if you <laughs> sell it to them. You know what I mean? So you need to study. There are things that you need right. to learn, right? I don't mean that. I just, I think that you just get to a point where you're just like, you know what? I've taken all of the advice. I've heard all of the opinions. I filter it, and now I'm doing what I want to do. So there's a point at your career where you feel like you have enough confidence to... I'm no longer concerned with what anybody else thinks. I remember after grad school, I would take myself on gallery visits, right, and, and go and visit. And I would see in galleries artists that were showing work that had ideas that I had in grad school that I was told not to do. Mm. And I'd walk around and I'd be like, oh my God, like I was thinking about this, I should have done this, right? Not in, I should have done it as in, you know, I'm trying to you know, do what that person's doing, but I had this particular idea to do X, Y, Z. I just got to a point where I just said, you know what, I'm just, I'm gonna make, and I'm not gonna worry about what other people think. And when it's time to have, get some really good feedback, I'm gonna be selective about who I have come into my space. Right? People that I trust, people I know that will be honest with me, but they also like me, you know? Yes. Um, so they really um, are going to have a conversation about my work that will help me grow and evolve. And everyone doesn't need to come into the space. Right. Right. Do you think the fact that you started in photography may have influenced your choice to have an almost exclusively black palette in your painting? You know what, I didn't think about that initially and I have recently been considering that. Um, photography, I loved black and white photography. One, one uh, you know, when I started photography, I, I, I loved documentary photography and documentary filmmaking. And um, I just love, and I love black and white movies and I loved with black and white that you had this absence of color. Um, you know the red, you know the red, yellow, green, blue, those uh, colors, um, and that you really it really allowed you to focus on the subject matter. You weren't distracted by color, is what it really is, right? There's no red to l lure you in this way or to distract or to uh, lead your eye into a particular direction. So I really love black and white photography. Also, I was using black and white photography because when you're learning photography, that's all you, <laughs> you are working right. with, right? You're working in the dark room. But uh, it was just perfect for what I wanted to do. It always felt like with black and white photography that when you, you're in an environment, you take a photo that it really kind of just shuts out the rest of the world, mm. right? Um, I love black and white photography. I love that I could capture this moment in this second. It also relates to kind of this fragmented writing that I have where, um, that I use in my videos and in some of the writing and in the titles of my work that I don't have to tell the entire story, but it's just this little fragment of piece that I just love that I relate to photography. And it wasn't until actually like in 2020, 2020 I believe it was, where I really started looking at my work. Um, my canvases are square frame. And I think I had come across some of my old photography. You know, when I was little, um, my mother gave me a camera or two. You know, back in the day, you had the long Kodak cameras. I with remember. The, <laughs> the external um, flash, that, you know, that yes. I think there are six of them and they'd burn out and you'd have to replace them. <laughs> and my mother had um, brownie cameras that were square format. And um, all of my, you know, the pictures that I saw of my mother when, um, you know, were in black and white, my grandmother were black and white, mm. they were all square format. Mm. And I think, I'm sure that stayed with me. Lots of experts in creativity and people who study artists and writers um, 
have suggested that constraints actually really do allow creativity to blossom. That's yeah. not the free verse in some ways may be harder to achieve than a very complicated sonnet because you have these creative constraints. Right. Do you feel like the, the black palette is a constraint that you can then work against? I never looked at it as a constraint. Um, when I started making black paintings, I was in grad school and I had been making, as I said, I'd taken a break um, in a particular quarter and only, I didn't take any studio classes, I only had lecture classes. And I had been making paintings that were bright and colorful and using a lot of green and the same colors over and over again. And I really didn't know why I was using those colors. I just gravitated towards them. And I decided to reduce my palette um, to a black marker on white paper. I divided this paper up into a grid and I was thinking about um, my relationship with my daughter, my relationship with my mother, my sister's relationship with my grandmother, this matrilineal mm. uh, relationship, right? Intergenerational relationship. And there is some emotional abuse there um, between my grandmother towards my, um, from my grandmother towards my sister. And so I started drawing in these grids um, shapes that I related to DNA and codes mm -hmm. and language. And I resonated with the circle. There are a lot of shapes that I wanted to explore, but I resonated with the circle and started drawing these um, black circles on paper. And then that moved to me using black paint on cut canvas. And it just continued to grow. And I didn't relate them to anything, any type of idea or narrative outside of language and DNA and codes and what might these shapes and the way I was using black paint communicate this energy within this intergenerational relationship. Mm. So I didn't see it as a constraint. It was just the material I was using. And I wanted to reduce everything. I, I clearly knew that I wanted to reduce everything to the formal elements and only let people focus on line, shape, color, texture, right? The formal elements of yeah, art. Yeah. And I didn't want to use color um, as a distraction. Some critics have suggested that your black palette is connected to being black in America or the experience of being black in America. What do you think about that? I think it's very accurate. It was not, so it's interesting, you know, um, I understand my paintings much more today than when I initially started them. So I was, like I said, all of my work was informed by the matrilineal intergenerational relationships. And I started making these black paintings um, that were initially portraits of celestial bodies. I never referred to them as moons, but people would walk into my studio mm -hmm. because there they, they were phases of these celestial bodies, but people, which is natural, refer to them as phases of the moon. And um, when I ma had my graduate thesis exhibition, I, made, I increased the scale, because they were small, like 13 by 13 inches. And I increased the scale to six feet by six feet. Mm -hmm. and. I related those, I was thinking about the relationship between the celestial bodies and our earthly bodies. Um, and so those initial um, paintings were about traumatic events that occurred against or were inflicted upon African Americans. So it was about the, this experience, right? Um, one of them was the uh, church bombing in um, Birmingham, Alabama, which killed four little girls in the mm. church. Um, uh, the Lovings, the white man and the black woman, Richard and Mildred Loving, right, and their inability to marry, and then when they did, that they were, you know, run out of town. Um, Hurricane Katrina and the response to black people in crisis. And then I also included um, two um, cel uh, celestial body paintings about my grandmother, um, who's emotionally abusive to my sister. Mm. So I was thinking about experience, and it was related to the black experience in America, the African American experience. But as I continued to make the paintings, they, I moved from the external, the public experience and memory, to more internal excava excavation of my own memories mm. and experience, um, and started to understand the paintings even more, that yes, they're about me, I am black, I'm using black paint, but it's also, you know, we are not a monolith. I, um, there's so much that, um, that can be expressed about us that I can say in a non-representational painting using the language of abstraction, um, but also that black is not a singular 
value, right? That there are so many values and richness within this sh shade of black, right? Or this hue of black. Yes. And um, that's my attempt in making these works. And it sounds like this has become a theme of your career, both on the canvas and out in the world, because conversations about abstraction, the work that you do now, seems to be an effort to bring voices that would not regularly be heard in the artistic community. Yeah, I think, you know, first of all, I, just my personal nature has always been one to share information and bring people together and create space for people. And it started when I had my studio right after grad school. I rented a storefront on Florence. Um, it was a great space, had this huge window out front that faced the street. And when I walked in, when I looked at the space before I bought it, um, there was one room, a door, and then another room. So I immediately thought, oh, this would be great for performance, right, to ex ex as an exhibition space. Sure. And so I created Project Space 2920. The address was 2920 West Florence. And so I invited, we did four shows in a year. I invited um, friends to come and exhibit. Because we had been talking, you know, I, I, the question was, I got out of grad school, now what? How do I get a gallery? How do I get a show? And I thought, well, uh, let's give ourselves shows. That's so awesome. um, I invited friends. Um, they're now referred to as Beck and Call, Becky and Colin Stafford. They were Sam Police, so they did a performance. They inaugurated the space and uh, launched the exhibition space. Uh, gave Glenn Wilson a solo show there. Um, Holly Temple was teaching at Otis at the time. Her class did an exhibition there. And then Eagle Nebula and Janet Dandridge did a performance in that space. Can you talk a little bit about Arts at Blue Roof? Sure. I'm working at Arts and Blue Roof as the executive director. I have came on in um, November of 2020 to launch the nonprofit and the artist in residency that we have, the artist residency that we have there. And um, the artist residency is called A Room of One's Own. Mm. And it is a artist residency for women artists. We do prioritize women in women artists in Council District 9. That's where we're located. 90003 zip code. There are 15 council districts in LA. And ours has the highest unemployment, the lowest education attainment, and the lowest household median income. So um, Galia Lin, who founded it, understood the need to create affordable studio spaces, but also to give women the space with a stipend and mentorship to connect to um, their creative um, desires, tendencies, you know, motivations, and to make work. And you've said previously that outsiders and self-taught artists formed inspiration for you when you were starting out. You know what, what I always appreciated um, about artists that are not formally trained and that term outsider artist um, is commonly used to identify them is I always saw such a freedom in their work. And it was a freedom that I wanted to possess in my own work. Mm. And um, I made a commitment this year. It's weird, you know, like I look at my work, um, so a friend of mine uh, came in to my studio and she saw my work. She's like, oh, I see so much freedom here, freedom that I don't see in, in some other folks' work. And uh, I really appreciated that. Um, even though I'm trained, and yes, I understand composition and all of these things, um, there is a lot of freedom in my work. But I. For me personally, I have to move past perfectionism. That is like a big issue for me. <laughs> so I made a commitment that I don't care about. I, I went to uh, some gallery openings with my artist friend, Olivia Booth. And she's a glass artist, really fabulous. And um, we were talking and like, you know, I, I had all of these issues. I, if I saw someone's work and they're like, you know, paint drippings or fingerprints on the side or all of this. And she was like, how? When you pour paint and you do X, Y, Z. And I just said, I, I wanted to commit to just, you know, I don't care about pencil lines or any of these things that would drive me crazy, you know. I'm just going to, I'm making without thinking and without editing. And I want to see what happens when I have that kind of freedom, you know, or, or, or not necessarily freedom, but that uh, removal of perfectionism, right? Lifting the veil of perfectionism. Freedom is something that is palpable in your work and also in your titles. You mentioned that you have a lot of fun with titles, that you're a word person. And I want to Mark sure. Bradford told me that I worked for Mark Bradford um, for 10 months when I was in grad school and he said, have strong titles. And it's just a natural extension, I think, of my, um, my desire to write. Well, it, it shows. It's beautiful. <laughs> and your titles are among my favorites. And my absolute favorite is, as the lady in green, how I sit with my legs open to give my crotch sunlight. Right. Uh, <laughs> and I think as that shows, 
you can be a serious artist and still have a <laughs> sense of humor. Well, well you, I should say, can you? Yes, I, you, you can. And uh, we, I guess it all also depends on how we define what is a serious artist, right? What does that mean? Yes. <laughs> um, but Great that point. title actually comes from uh, into Jaki Shange's book, um, or cho cho choreo poem, um, uh, Four Color Girls Who Have Considered Suicide mm, When the Rainbow Is Beautiful enough. work. And as the, the, the Lady in Green was one of the women. Yes. And uh, in, her, in one of her monologues, she says that, how I sit with my legs open to get my crotch sunlight. And I've shared um, with folks, um, when I talk about this painting, that I first saw that um, play on television when I was younger. And, you know, I'm watching it and into it, but when that line, when she expressed that line, I remember thinking, that's a thing? Like, what? You can do that? And it always stuck with me. Right? Well, it's great, and it's such freedom, and it's so, yes. it's wonderful. It is. Um, did you ever have moments when you were feeling like, Hmm, I don't know if I can like I don't know if I can do this artist thing or was it always a slam dunk this was gonna be your life? Oh yes, all the time. I had it last night. Um, <laughs> <laughs> really? Okay, tell dish. <laughs> oh, so you know what it is is um I'm always going to be an artist. Sometimes you just think, you know, how long can I be poor or how long mm. can I, you know, whatever it is. You know, you have your moments and then you wake up in a couple of days and you go to the beach and smell the ocean and meditate and then you're fine, you know. Um, I think one thing, you know, that for anyone who <clears throat> has been on this journey, um, it, we have to define success for ourselves. Um, you have to be very confident. Um, being an artist is a really vulnerable thing, right? Because mm. you're making, and, and, and when I say artist, I'm including everyone, whether you're a performing artist, a visual artist, you're a literary artist, you know, there's a, a whole group of, you know, of, of how we can define an artist, who artists are. Because you produce something that's really important to you and you share it with the world and that puts you in a really vulnerable position, right? To have people critique it, to look at it, to ignore it, right? Um, but you are in a position just in life and on your own journey where um, other artists, they may be your peers, they may be your friends, um, are having varying levels of success, mm. right? And it's very easy to compare yourself, right? And you have to really be strong and center yourself so you understand that it's going to happen for you when it's going to happen and that there are, we're all on a different journey. Some of us have to work, right? Um, some of us have mortgages and families to provide for. And so there are different ways that we're pursuing this journey. And it can be challenging and frustrating and, and you know, confusing and all of these wonderful things and wonderful and joyful at the same time, sure. right? You know, so we, all, we, we all have our moments. So you said you have to define success for yourself. How do you define success for yourself? At this moment, I would say that I am successful, honestly, if I can maintain my studio. Mm. <laughs> you know, if I can maintain my studio, my studio is providing for itself, I feel that I am successful. Now, do I have grandiose desires and ideas of, you know, what I would like for myself? Yes, but I think in this moment, you know, my studio is providing for itself and I feel good. I'm like, I'm doing this. And you have a show yeah. right now, right? At Band of Vices? No, that show was in last May. I have a show actually that's opening on April 22nd at the Korean Cultural Center. It's called Oh, goodness, forgive me, Mark Greenfield, uh, who curated it. Um, Phoenix, I want to say like Phoenix Rising, but it's a response to the L.A. riots. Oh, kind of a conversation amazing. about what we're, what's happening now. Um, 16 Korean-American artists, 16 African-American artists, so I have work in that show. Um, and then I have other opportunities that... Um, uh, an, another show, a group show that's going to um, curated by Jill Moniz that's going to open in October. Yeah, there are that things that are like coming That sounds like success out. to me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, and you also teach. I do teach. In our Los Angeles Community Co I College I do. District. I teach two-dimensional design at Los Angeles City College. And my classes right now are all online and they're asynchronous. Do you have any advice that you would give to our community college students who want to pursue it? Uh, a career, a life as a creative artist, and yet don't have any kind of model for that in their home or in even in their neighborhood maybe right now. Experiment. 
explore materials, have fun, take as many classes as you can, take painting classes, ceramic classes, take a photography class, film, because there are all sorts of ways that you can express yourself and you want to find mediums in which you can do that. And then they might, they might intersect and overlap in some way, right? But have fun, do it all, right? Um, be open to constructive criticism, right? Mm. Um, there's so much to learn and investigate. And be your own teacher. Go to galleries, go see films, go see plays, um, read about artists, look up folks. One of the, th the things that I did when I was in undergraduate school and in grad school is I would find an artist, come across an artist that whose work that I liked, and I'd look them up and I'd go to their website, and then I'd go to their about or CV page, mm. and I'd, find, I'd look, where do they go to school? Um, what residencies do they have? Uh, what um, awards do they receive? Um, and that opened me up to so much, right? Because there are things that I didn't know. Sure. And then I started seeing, like, you know, let, let's just say I look up 20 artists. Oh, well, 12 of them did this residency. Mm -hmm. This must be where the direction I should go. 12 right. of them got this award. I want that. Then that'd be on my wish list of this award that I'd like to receive, right? Do your own research. There's it so much out like there. It sounds like you did a lot of your homework. That's yeah, well, you know, I think it's just also a part of who I am. I'm a very um, inquisitive person, uh, an investigative, uh, have an investigative personality. Um, but. Don't be passive in your own learning mm -hmm. and evolution, right? School is, is here for a particular purpose, but there's so much learning to do outside in the world. So school is just one part of that, that you have to take, uh, there's a lot of personal responsibility in, in evolving as a person, right? And pursuing certain things and finding out information. Can I be nosy for a second? Of course. We can edit it out. <laughs> Walk me through your day as an artist. Like, what does the day of, an, of a mm. successful artist look like? Wow. Well, I appreciate you keep continuing to uh, put that uh, adjective uh, successful in there. Um, what does a day look like? It, can, it looks different at times, right? Um, there are certain days of the week since I work. Um, there are dedicated days that I have in the studio. Um, I have a goal to be in the studio at a certain time, but I always get in later because I just have an issue with time. Uh, but it, it can look like me being in the studio and literally looking. And I'm, I'm, I've looked at my work for hours, right? I'm looking and I'm feeling them out, you know, the energy of them and thinking about them. Um, it could be me sketching in the studio afterwards. Um, it can be me pulling out a book and reading, right? Um, you know, experimenting with mixing my paints and painting. Um, there are days sometimes where all I'm doing is the foundational work on quite a few paintings at the same time. And mm -hmm. then I do have a um, part of my process um, for applying paint is pouring. So I have days where specifically I'm pouring, you know, that are only going to be my pouring days, right? And so I do at least two or three of those and you know, um, consec this consecutive order, right? And, and I need a certain amount of time for them to dry. And then I know, okay, I'm gonna, uh, over the next two weeks, I'm gonna pour these three paintings. So that's all that I'm doing. Is there any area in which you'd like to grow in your career? I think it's more about, um, I committed to experimenting and doing all of the things that I thought that I couldn't do, or mm. that I was told that I couldn't do. I love that. Right? Um, so I'm working on the black paintings. There are, there's a series, a suite of paintings that I need to finish that are related to a painting called Sane Sister Schizo Sister. So there are about four more of those that I need to finish. There are some others that I need to finish, but I have, even though I'm working in the black paint, um, a lot of people don't know in 2014, I showed um, paintings at Papillon and they were paintings that were made with synthetic hair and they are mm. colored, um, it's colored hair. So I've been working on those again and um, I'm no longer uh, um, believing that I can only do one thing, right? Oh, I love that. Um, so those call to me, so I'm working on those. And I have some older paintings that weren't working, so I'm interested in working in sculpture with those, so some soft sculpture that I started last year, but I really needed to focus on um, getting things together for that Band of Isis show. So I'm working in sculpture in my studio, I have those uh, synthetic hair paintings as I'm working on the black painting, so just doing anything and everything that I want to do without editing and thinking twice about it. Oh, I'm not overanalyzing anything in the studio. I love that. Um, is there anything else you'd like to share? Just to enjoy life. <laughs> if you want to be an artist, 
uh, you already are one, just do what you're supposed to do, whatever that is, right? If, you, if you're an artist and you love photography, take your camera out with, with you wherever you go and take photos. If you are exploring, you know, painting, then paint. I guess nobody needs to give you the label, right? Right. You can do the activity. Yeah. I just figure, you know, like if you're a, an architecture student and you say you want to be an architect, well, you already are an architect, you're just untrained. Just claim it. Claim it oh, like and that. just, you know. Excellent. Thank you so much for being with us Thank today, you. Lisa. Thank you for having me. This is really great. Thank I you. I enjoyed it. Thank you.